Internet safety, as well as privacy and security, are components of digital citizenship. But since online learning has become so prevalent and so much of our lives are digital, we need to stay informed and learn the best practices to protect ourselves and our students to make digital spaces safer. We're talking about cybersecurity on tonight's On Ed Mentors. Happy Monday, everyone. Welcome to On Ed Mentors. I'm your host, Noah Daniel. On Ed Mentors originated here on Voice Ed Radio and helps to inform and fuel our work at the Mentory, where our goal is to cultivate a collaborative mentorship community for educators grounded in professional learning, well being, and efficacy by giving us a place to listen to and learn from each other. Each week, I gather a different panel of voices of educators and others within and beyond borders to explore a topic that I hope is relevant and timely for educators. Tonight is particularly timely, but we'll tell you more about that in a moment. Before I introduce our panel, I want our audience to be aware that they can follow the conversation on Twitter from our handle at The Mentory using our show hashtag OnEdMentors. That's O-N-E-D-M-E-N-T-O-R-S. If you have an idea that you want to share or a question you want to ask the panel, I'll be monitoring our handle and the hashtag throughout the show. From computer health and passwords, to banking and online shopping, to social media and privacy, we live in a cyber society. If school is a place to learn about and prepare for our world, our cyber literacy is important. And with cyber literacy comes a need to become educated about cyber security. I've known Tim for a while, and a few months back, our leadership at every level coordinator at the Mentory, Melissa Jensen, brought my attention to his secondment. I was so interested in learning more and I'm thrilled that he's here to discuss tonight's topic. He became our first panelist, and I want to introduce him now. Tim King, welcome to the show. Thanks. I'm thrilled to be here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I've been teaching in the Upper Grand District School Board for the last 20 years. Um, I've developed a computer technology program in Fergus High School, and we got into cybersecurity in 2017. And since then, we've just been developing our skills and, and building out a really big program there. Well, I'm really excited to hear about all the things that you're doing and how we can learn more about that. So thanks for being here. Um, when we were talking about who should be on this episode, both you and Stephen spoke about Claudio Popa, who's also here with us tonight. So Claudio, welcome to the show. As you unmute, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. That was a smooth segue. Thank you for reminding me to unmute. I appreciate being invited to the show. This is great. Um, uh, what can I tell you about me? I, um, my, uh, my journey with privacy and security started when I was about six years old and we had no computers whatsoever, but we had this typewriter that was actually illegal because back then in, in Eastern Europe, you had to have a special permit and you had to have these things approved by the government and they had to know at all times what you were doing with it. And it's at that time that I started, that those seeds started germinating around privacy and human rights and and what I f didn't know would turn into information security. But now that I'm a, a lot older, uh, not any wiser, but a lot more certified professionally, now I speak with diverse audiences, all kinds of cool people, and I teach security and privacy together in a way that, you know, the hardest thing is to, is to make it entertaining and, uh, and educational at the same time. But really, I, I try to lead with the legitimacy that I've gathered over a few decades, and I enjoy every moment of it. So I really appreciate being invited to your show. Thank you. I'm excited to learn more. I was meeting with the team at Knowledge Flow, looking to round out the panel and include student voices. And I was so thrilled to find out that Louise Turner could not only join us, but she was a cybertarian, a cyber titan. That sounds so funny, a cybertarian. We're going to have to explore that word at some point. We'll have to look up the domain name. See if we <laughs> for sure. Uh, cyber titan for three years in high school and two-time national finalist. She's at Queen's studying cybersecurity, and she's here with us tonight. Louise, welcome to the show. Hi there. Thank you for having me. I think I said a few things about you. Do you want to add anything? 
For sure. Yeah. So um, as you said, I, I am at Queen's University. I'm a second year going to third year with the cybersecurity specialization. Um, I got into cybersecurity from mainly just Tim King introducing me to this whole world. I joined the computer technology class in grade nine. I'd always been kind of interested in computers, but never really delved into it much. And from there, I got introduced to Cyber Titan, I happened to become a two-time national finalist and the captain of the a former captain of the best all female team in the country for Cyber Titan, which is pretty awesome. That's and now awesome. I'm now I'm here and, and I'm loving loving life and I'm loving learning about about all this cybersecurity stuff. That's so cool. I can't wait to hear more about what you're doing. Our last panelists were having some audio issues, but I know that Stephen Hurley never gives up on anybody. So I met Paul Davis many years ago at my school. He was a great resource for a lot of digital things, and I'm so happy he was able to join us here tonight. Hopefully his audio will work out and we'll actually get to hear from him. But I'm going to go into the questions and get us started. So what interests you most, panel, about cybersecurity? What's the draw? And as everybody on the panel remembers to mute your mic in between and raise your hand to let me know you want to say something, I will come to you. Tim. So for me, I, I was an IT guy before I uh, became a teacher. So what happened was I, I went to a Cisco conference in 2016, and uh, I was just amazed by how everything had moved to the cloud. And of course, we know that's happened in education. But for me to suddenly realize the implications of that cybersecurity wise, it, when I was in IT, it was all Ethernet cables and we built networks and it was all quite secure because nobody could just come in on the air. But now everything's over Wi-Fi, everybody's remote. Um, the, the complexity of cybersecurity, it let me see networking for the first time in action. I'd, I'd built all these networks and I knew how they worked, but I'd never seen the data flowing over them. And the first time I got into cyber, I could see the data. That's so interesting. And it's also interesting that you switch between data and data, but that tomato tomato conversation can happen another time. Who else wants to take this question? Louise? Yeah, so I have a, a few things that really drew me to cybersecurity and are especially uh, drawing me closer towards it now is how much we like don't know uh, about it, like how massive this field is how it's just like exponentially expanding with every year and the average person knows next to nothing about what security actually is and what it actually means so i think it's like very important to teach people that and as well i find going into cybersecurity and learning more about it really takes away all those levels of like abstraction that you normally get when you're dealing with computer science. Like most of the time people just kind of write their code and then not really worry about what's going on underneath. But I really find going into that, uh, like unveiling those layers of abstraction, very interesting. And cybersecurity is super system level heavy. And I think it's very cool to go into that stuff. Well, your interest is what's going to drive your excellent work. Thank you so much for adding that. Claudio? I think that was a brilliant observation by Louise. That was just great. The the fact that um, most people don't realize just what a broad series of topics this is. This is an entire world. And people just say, well, you know what? Here's a couple of tips and, and go off and, and be successful. But the the importance of what we're talking about is that it, it's not just... Uh, a set of disciplines and, of course, a set of professions, but you can live and breathe what it means to operate in a risk-based manner. So, of course, we do that on a daily basis because we're, you know, we're thinking about risk when we cross the street. But are we thinking the same way when we're traveling or uh, voyaging across the what we call the modern internet and all of that risk-based thinking is applied in a more or less concrete way and so Louise was alluding to these various levels of abstraction that she's learned about that she sees equivalence to in the real world and those are the kinds of things that we like to get kids excited about 
when we go into schools and we talk to them, not just about concrete things like, you know, let's let's hack a banking system, which which we we do. But let's talk to them about how computers are analogous to us and and what a wonderful way it is to see their brains think differently when they walk out of a classroom versus how they were walking into one. Taking advantage of that curiosity is really what this is all about for me. And that's how I unlocked my own curiosity and fascination, endless fascination with <laughs> this very, very broad topic. That's so interesting. I'm I'm thrilled that Stephen was able to get Paul into this conversation. So I'm going to re-welcome Paul Davis, who speaks about a lot of elements of digital interests and security. But Paul, why don't you introduce yourself? Welcome to the show. Thank you. Can we just confirm you can hear me? I can hear you. Awesome. Uh, here's a big plug for Brave Browser over Chrome when you have problems. So there's my uh, plug for Brave. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So thank you for having me. My name is Paul Davis. Uh, I've dedicated my 32 years in IT and cyber, uh, but the last 12 have been in education. And it started off with a simple conversation at my daughter's school about 12 years ago when I was asked, why do kids get in trouble using technology? And a very candid conversation with my daughter's principal led to me delivering a presentation to her school. And one thing led to another. And as I sit in a parking lot after just leaving a school speaking to parents, I've now had the pleasure of speaking to over 740,000 students in six provinces and five states in person, 95,000 virtually, the OPP, the RCMP, Canada Border Services, and the Department of National Defense. But my passion is educating kids. Educating, you know, CEOs and CFOs and law enforcement, that's cool. But the engagement with kids, the look on their faces, answering questions, the Q&A afterwards, the props. Um, that's really the the place for me. And again, perhaps it was fate, uh, but this started off with a conversation and here's where I am today. And uh, you know, when people say you love your job, I say, I don't work for a living. I'm living the dream. I get to go and educate with my knowledge and empower kids to make uh, really good choices. So that's how it all happened. <laughs> I feel like I've made such a good choice in having all of you here. So I'm feeling pretty fantastic about it. Every one of you have passionate reasons for being part of this conversation. And Tim, you kind of talked a little bit about how things have changed. But I, I really want to hear from all of you. What changes have you noticed in cybersecurity over the last few years and our deepening of our digital relationships? And for those that are just coming and listening right now, remember that you can tweet out your questions or add to the conversation by following our hashtag, Tim. Just jump in there really quickly. Um, did you know Stephen Hurley was actually on Apollo 13? Um, anyway, uh, I knew we'd get it working. Um, what I've found has changed recently is uh, the attack surface. Um, since COVID happened and everybody went remote, the expectation now is that everybody can just work from anywhere. And um, if you imagine you worked in a shop and you had to try and stop people from taking things out of the shop, but then you, you decentralize the shop and the shop could just be anywhere and people could just walk away with things. And imagine how difficult that would be. And that's exactly what's happened in cybersecurity. The, the idea that we're now going to an office is really yesterday's idea. And, and all of that, all of that uh, pain and suffering has landed on cybersecurity. The attack surface is huge now. I can't even imagine how that hacking experience and how all of the cyber theft and all of those elements are impacting schools. And we'll definitely talk about that. Thank you for, for noting that, Claudia. So what we've noticed, and because I, I, I am fortunate enough to deliver services to a broad uh, range of industry sectors, is that if I were to condense it down to three things, essentially criminals, uh, companies, and the public at large are the, the three main groups, the three audiences, the three participants. Criminals have made it all about the money. 
right? So back in the 90s, you would have uh, quasi, you know, gray hats, maybe even black hats, who would break into things mostly to see if they could do it. And then in many cases, they would brag about it. And, and so profit was secondary. Nothing but money uh is is primary today today it's all about and you, we see it in the kinds of ransomware and and double extortion types of attacks that we we lament when they occur even against hospitals today right like they have to be really hungry if they're going to be attacking children's hospitals or um, old people's homes or schools or whatever it might be. It's about the money. They want to get paid. Companies themselves today are all about the data. Even companies that we've known for decades, those companies that used to make a product, well, they still make a product today. They've figured out ways to make the product really cheaply. But now these companies are about the data. They want to co collect as much data as, as possible. All of their products are now connected to the internet. They've got cameras built into them. They have transactional processing built into them. They've got trackers in online apps. They try to be constantly connected so they can collect as much data. That's what's valuable to them. And as far as people are concerned, it's about their attention span. It's about how much time they have with their own thoughts, which right now is a, a very competitive battleground because everybody is fighting for your eyeballs. You're struggling to finish an article. Like I find myself trying to finish reading an article, even though I'm popping open so many tabs on a daily basis, I have maybe a hundred tabs open and I'm using multiple monitors and I struggle to maintain control over my attention and my, um, and, and I'm trying to keep distractions at bay so I can finish as many things as I can on a daily basis. So those are the most valuable things today it didn't used to be that way but things have accelerated these trends one of those things is the cloud everything is in the cloud everything's running inside a, a website including uh, the zencaster tool that that steven has made available to us for this purpose it's a fantastic tool uh, but there are so many other things that have changed and accelerated the trends that I just uh, talked about. And, and on a daily, a daily basis, I, I deal with it uh, however I can. And I try to help my kids deal with just the onslaught on their own personal time and attention um, and all these dopamine uh, uh, creation uh, tools that we call online games or ads or social media or instant messaging don't help that much with with reclaiming that attention span. Anyway, thank you for that question. I think attention is a very significant issue as we dive deeper into the access we have to the world. And we forget a lot of the time that everything, all the data from all of that is being collected by somebody, harvested for some purpose. So I'm glad that you raised all of those issues. There are a lot in there. Uh, Louise and then Paul. Yeah, so from a more social perspective, like a, a younger student perspective, what I'm seeing with cybersecurity is uh, how people's attitudes are changing towards it. So the general public is like becoming a lot more aware, I find, of these issues. And they're getting a lot more ads for things like VPNs, like NordVPN, things like that. So the general like surface level knowledge is being spread around a lot more about, okay, so my data privacy is very important, but people are very much commercializing it as well, like with those VPN companies or different kind of uh, ad blocker companies or antivirus companies. So it's very commercialized. And because of that low attention span that you guys were just mentioning as well, people who are getting introduced to this idea of cybersecurity being important, they see all these ads for things, but they don't really have the deeper knowledge or the attention span to properly look into them before they kind of throw their money at the wall with it. So I think it's very important that people 
are starting to have a deeper understanding of why things like what why is a VPN important? How does it actually work? Is it safe for my computer? Is this specific antivirus safe or is it just bloatware? Things like that. So everybody's starting to get more knowledge, but it's very surface level. I'm listening to you and I have to look up a few of the things you just said. So certainly surface level, if that. Um, Paul. If there's one thing I believe in is always surrounding yourself with people you can learn from uh, as we're doing here this evening. And the reason I say that is because the one thing I've learned, especially since about 2018, 2019, uh, is that humanity is becoming very complacent. And the last DEF CON conference I attended, which was in 2019 in person, I remember interviewing a bunch of hackers and they love talking. If you get them in the right position, they love talking. They love sharing information. And I'm a sponge. I love to gather information. And although you can go down the path of, I'm talking, you know, ground level hacking, the easiest way to get into people's lives is through social engineering. And they've said quite openly, it's, it's never been easier to extract money from people, to trick people into clicking links. Why? Because we become so lazy. We, be, we think that everything online is anonymous and no one will know. And it's almost that, as if they're laughing at us and they're saying, this is too easy. And you know, respectfully, in many cases it is. I think we need to educate ourselves with the very, very basics. We don't have to make this conversation complicated. We need basic everyday strategies, which can be taught at the high school level for sure. I mean, I start off my privacy conversation, believe it or not, with my grade four, five, six session, seven, eight gets a bit more intense, high school a bit more intense. But if you give people the basics, you make the job of the black hat very difficult. You know, white hats are great because they're out there and they're trying to help us. And these guys are great at volunteering information and sharing, but we have to stop being so trusting of the app we download of the website we visit, stop randomly clicking on QR codes, but we're so comfortable with that, that it's making the job of cybersecurity um, for the bad guys so simple. So with a bit of basic education, we can really, really change the, the, uh, the playing field. Um, so complacency, I think is the greatest issue that I've seen, social engineering for sure. Yeah, I'm feeling um, like I, I have so much work to do to do a good job for my students and become better prepared, better versed, more savvy. Um, you've raised some issues about people, you know, clicking on websites, downloading apps or going to QR codes. But what other aspects of cybersecurity do you guys find most concerning? Like what what do you add? What do you punctuate when you're delivering these conversations or engaging in the conversations or speaking? Claudia? I think it's important for people to realize that privacy protection and security are not about the brands that you're buying, but about the way that these tools and technologies work. And there's no shortcut. You need to understand how they work. Now, there are lots of educational resources out there. There are people that you can trust. There are ways that you can learn these things more easily. But fundamentally, we need to understand how to select tools effectively, how to, you need to learn how to trust in the internet age. This this idea of, of digital trust is not something that we as humans were born with because we evolved into the creatures that we are today and suddenly we're using technology to elevate our own capabilities. Um, this obviously there are ramifications to this whole discussion we can go into ai and chat gpt and all that stuff which will allow people to extend their own capabilities in ways that we can't easily imagine right now but the flip side of that is that companies don't really know who they're hiring either and in many cases they don't mean to engage with companies that are untrusted or should not be trusted, but they do because those companies are offering something that is very compelling. And in many cases, those companies offer it in a way that is not 
trustworthy. So for example, uh, recently, um, a company called um, uh, LastPass uh, made the news for the sixth or seventh time they had some sort of a, a security incident. And people were very surprised that this happened. Why did all these passwords and password vaults get stolen by criminals? Well, if you turn back the clock a couple of months, you will notice that they had a massive breach that stole their trade secrets and their intellectual property, which meant that criminals had access to that information. So if you turn back the clock, you realize that people without uh, competencies, without certifications, without expertise, actually developed the tool. And they were just great marketers. They were great at making sales pitches and should never have turned into a, a behemoth of a, of a company that it turned into. And then if you do your due diligence, you realize that the company that ended up owning that organization also owned a, another company, which was a couple of years ago used to track and in some cases assassinate journalists. So doing a little bit of due diligence is a skill that is very difficult to acquire, but a very useful one to have. Essentially, the, the, the one thing that I find concerning is this expectation of finding shortcuts. You need to realize that the act of collecting too much data on the part of companies and businesses is the flip side of the act of sharing too much information by individual users. And this is the same problem. Companies and individuals don't understand how to value that most um, um, uh, salient, that most um, expensive today of currencies, which is to say data or data, depending on how Tim wants to <laughs> uh, pronounce it. Uh, but just to summarize, understanding the value of data will force everybody to understand how it should be protected and how it should be shared. Um, that's a whole skill set in itself, but making it exciting for our audiences is, is really what we're talking about tonight. And, and I think, I mean, I find data and data very exciting, and I feel an elevated sense of privilege to get to teach about it critically in math. But I think, you know, coming back to the skills that we need to teach our students, we need to build for ourselves. And I think your point about, you know, having access to all of that, looking for shortcuts, understanding the value, the commoditization of data, there are layers to these skills that no curriculum can catch up to. And we need to be able to look to that and say, okay, we need some explicit instruction. Tim? I think, uh, well, first of all, I, I live in superposition. I've been studying a lot of quantum lately, so I'm, I'm, I'm in England and Canada at the same time. So it'll be data and data and data. Um, what stuns me is the, the fact that we've leaned into technology as much as we have in our learning and in our teaching, and yet people don't seem to want to take any responsibility for that. And I, I really struggle with that. I, I think it verges on being irresponsible. Um, and I, my theory is uh, if we lean into teaching cyber safety in the classroom, we've somehow taken on liability for it. But we took on that liability the minute we put a student on a network device. And if that happened in grade one, that's when we took responsibility for that. Um, so for me, from an education perspective, as an educator, I, I'm absolutely stunned that we treat educational technology the way we do with zero responsibility on the part of the education systems. That is such an interesting point. Thank you. Claudia, you wanted to add? Um. Uh, thank you for that, uh, and thank you, Tim, uh, for leading into EdTech cybersecurity. You knew I would bite. Um, I, I'm in. I'm. I've developed a certain uh, set of skills 
<laughs> within ed tech. And uh, the fact that when I hear Tim talking about liability, it's really about the accountability that our educational institutions have or should have vis-a-vis -vis what happens to the information that they share with technology vendors and software developers and cloud applications because our educational institutions today really do not possess the skill set necessary to be able to adequately select education technology so they expose the children that they should be protecting to a number of privacy invasive tools technologies platforms and business owners who are uniquely after the the data so in not doing that due diligence in selecting education technology properly that's what we call negligence and that's what should lead to the accountability that that parents and their children uh, deserve um, we can get into more examples but effectively there aren't enough stop gaps today to say you know what there's a really cool tool let's bring it in, into our classroom today there's a direct line between saying i want that flashy colorful object and i would like to put it on the table in the classroom whereas in the world of cybersecurity, you would say, let's do our due diligence, let's figure out who owns this, let's figure out what data is or are transferred in and out of the classroom once you plug that thing in, and let's see how long that information is going to continue to exist on the systems and servers of whoever's behind this flashy tool that mm -hmm. looks so nice and appealing. Yeah, but what a fantastic way to get students involved in that. Like one of the things you have me thinking about is my board has, you know, green, red, and yellow tools that we can use and they've vetted and they've made those decisions. So as an educator, if it's a yellow tool, I need parent permission signed each individual tool that I'm using separately in order to use it. And I defer to them. And it's such an interesting point to decide and I, we saw a lot of that with chat GPT in terms of how the boards responded and some of the critical thinking that educators are doing to talk through it. But you remind us that if we had the tools to evaluate that, if we knew the questions to ask, if we could, if we could utilize that as classroom educators, then, then that would really help to build um, a more thoughtful, I, I guess, less complacent, just going back to Paul's point, um, group of students. But one of the things that expands on that and Alana King, who's, who's tweeting furiously through all of this, is asking like, what are those implications for K-12 educators when these things are changing all the time and the curriculum doesn't say it? How do we invite educators to understand why we need to do this besides this conversation that clearly every person needs to hear? Well, hopefully, okay, Tim, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. But um, you mentioned my secondment at the beginning. I'm working for ICTC, and that's the Information Communication Technology Council. So it's the IT Council of Canada. And in that role, we've been working with Claudio at, uh, at Knowledge Flow and a whole pile of partners. There are so many people out there who have vetted professionally secure resources that can help people with this. You don't need to be the expert on this, but I don't understand what the hesitancy is about engaging with people who are. Um, and I mean, Claudio will speak to this too, but that that hesitancy just, it, it amazes me. And I, I mean, I, I spend my days now going into classrooms and it's a real struggle to get this material in front of, of students. Um, to the point where we're, we're thinking maybe the idea is to, to talk to parents directly instead, because I, I think just teachers are overloaded anyway. We're, we're all post-pandemic. I taught through the whole thing. I understand the difficulties there. But again, if we're going to lean on this technology, we, we need to take some responsibility for it. 
I think I appreciate the empathy that teachers are overwhelmed and it's always good to know that it doesn't have to fall on us. But at the same time, we need to be able to facilitate these conversations and even initiate them. I agree, by the way, in terms of talking to families, but Paul and then Louise, let's hear what you guys have to say. Free comes at a cost and the cost is privacy. And if you look at all the school boards and I've been to many of them, you're using a lot of free products. Now, can you fault the, the school boards for that? Of course not, because schools are strapped with funding. If I visit an independent school, uh, they take their security um, lockdowns of the technology to a next level. But this is, again, unfair. But parents have sent their kids to a school, and the school has a lot of money. So they're able to make that investment. For a large school board to make the proper investment in protecting our children's privacy is astronomical. And school boards don't have that funding in place. Although they're given the quote unquote free products for education, which got them through, um, you know, remote learning and all that, which we have to appreciate, there's still a lot of cost. Like I said, data mining. What can we do differently? Simple. Uh, number one, if I were a Google certified educator, if I'm a educator, would I be logging into my home computer with my school account? Absolutely not. I would have a dedicated device strictly for the purposes of education, but that would probably come at the cost of out of the educator's pocket, which is not fair because they weren't asked to be thrown in this situation. They were said, they said, Hey, you need to teach our children and here's how you do it. And every, I mean, listen, during the pandemic, I donated five computers to families whose kids couldn't even connect online. We can't expect that everyone had the technology to connect. So some educators went home and had to use their own technology. But what they did was they were logging into these platforms using their devices, which had personal data. It's all about education. But the biggest issue is funding. Um, if they were better funded, there are better solutions out there that respect more privacy. Um, it really comes down to that. So we can't change that um, because I don't think we're ever going to see any funding changes. But I really do feel for everyone um, that was part participating in all this online learning and just giving away a boatload of data. So thanks for letting me rant on that. I, you didn't rant. It was all really important. I hope that we do see funding changes. I think the funding model has to change. But Louise and then Claudia. Yeah, from a more sociological perspective, like very broad, um, going off of what Tim said a bit as well, the uh, fear that a lot of people have with technology, I think, is a big detriment because, of course, there are things to be scared of with cybersecurity. There's a lot of like the amount of things that we should be scared of is kind of absurdly large. But it's the fear of like understanding how technology works kind of. What I was saying with when people don't have a high enough attention span to actually look into the services that they're getting, like their VPNs and such. So they're just getting it because they're scared and not really understanding how it works. So like starting from a very young age to kind of demystify computers, to stop making how they work seem like magic, so scary, because then we're not really going to believe that we are in danger if we think that everything that happens in a computer is all magic then nobody's gonna think that there's anything really wrong i see even a lot of people my age a lot of people my age don't really understand the first thing about how computers work and they're kind of scared to learn it and they're very reluctant to learn it because they've come so far in their life just kind of agreeing with the fact that it works and not questioning it so it's something that i think you have to start off with very early is demystifying this whole idea of cybersecurity and of computers in general. Excellent point. Claudio. Thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to say that some school boards have billion dollar budgets and what do they do with those budgets? They allocate them to what they call innovation and innovation to them doesn't mean the same thing that it means to Tim King, for example. Innovation should mean all the practices around research and the 
the the um, uh, tools and techniques and education that goes with understanding new technologies. And once you understand the technology, then you acquire it and you use it in a very controlled manner. But my simple point is that instead of immediately investing in the latest or what appeals, uh, appears to be the latest education technology, school boards should share those budgets for the purpose of educating not just teachers, but also their administrators, because in some cases they're, they prefer to be funding their lawyers and their legal protection funds instead of uh, funding the, um, the adoption of secure ways of doing things and, and the acquisition of proper technologies that will not be driven by how much data it collects from children, but it should be driven by how much value is provided to those, uh, to those classrooms. I, I think that where you define innovation becomes the challenge. A lot of schools, especially private schools with tons of funding, get it because they capitalize on the perception of the word innovation and not necessarily being on the pulse of those new technologies that you're referring to. Paul, did you want to add something? Uh, no, sorry, I, I didn't realize I had my hand up there. That's uh, no look, problem. Oh, yeah. Listen, when it comes to the funding piece, um, whether it's they got the funding and they haven't allocated, um, or they don't have the funding, either way, um, the issue uh, lies in the fact that we're using a lot of free stuff, and I get in quotation marks, uh, perhaps because of lack of dollars in a certain department in a certain organization because there is technology out there that can be better utilized and it costs money though like i said i've seen it in the independent schools that don't depend on all the free stuff but the pandemic forced us to take as much as we could for free without the proper um, education but having said that um, can we make changes yeah absolutely it just takes a bit of um i think education and that can start at the board level. It can start with teachers, um, but it definitely starts with um, experts like who are on the panel tonight. I really, there's so much expertise. So let's go back to some of the aspects of digital citizenship, because we do have that in the curriculum. Let's talk about how cybersecurity relates to, um, and I'm worried about time, so I'm going to throw out a whole bunch of them, and you can decide which one you want to connect with. Internet safety, privacy and security, relationships and communication, cyberbullying and digital drama, digital footprints and reputation, self-image and identity, information literacy, creative credit and copyright. Which one do you want to take and address in terms of um, school and what we, we already have that learning embedded, hopefully? Uh, Claudio. So I'll I'll take the first two. The the one thing that I try to underline to everyone is that privacy is a human right and we need to protect our own privacy as well as that of others as if it was our own. Like literally we need to protect children and even teachers and parents um as if they were our own parents. Um the fact is Privacy is a right, and cybersecurity is a tool to protect that right. It's a, it's a very, very simple concept to understand and a very simple concept to explain. So as it pertains to um, internet safety, we put in place useful tools that help us stay safe on the internet. And that's why when I talk to schools or when I talk to companies, it's really the same thing. You put in the controls that ensure that you don't even see the pop-ups, you don't see the contests, you don't see the trackers. They are blocked before they're allowed to be displayed on your screen or even before they're allowed to be uh, to, to enter your network. And that's what it means to have not just privacy and security, but layered cybersecurity, which kind of uh, goes back to what Louise said earlier about that defense in depth that she was alluding to from an from an abstract perspective. Thanks for taking that on. Who wants to talk about? Okay, great, Tim. 
I'll take a stab at it, but it's a lot of things. Um, on the weekend, uh, Elena took us out to a TVO event about whether social media is destroying democracy. And it was a very interesting debate. But by the end of it, there were a lot of questions around how much do you want people to do for you? And I feel like that's sort of the situation we're in with technology now. Um, like Paula said, there's all these free things, but they're not free. You know, the, the, the standing saying is if you're not paying for it, you're the product. So, and that's just like people don't do this out of the goodness of their heart. Like uh, whatever you pick, apps, any apps for education aren't done benevolently. They're done with intention, whether that's, getting students familiar with your product so they'll keep using it as an adult when they can monetize that relationship. Um, whatever it is, uh, that's complicated. So I feel like out of the list you had there, that, that information literacy piece is probably at the bottom of this. And that's something that could plug into a lot of curriculums. I, I used to be an English teacher. So for me, when I think about that as a form of media literacy, uh, that, that seems like a very obvious thing to go after. And yet I, I wonder how many English classes are focusing on media literacy in a modern sense when we're in this interactive space that seems really chaotic and overwhelming. And and so rather than deal with that, we're going to go back to just doing the same media literacy stuff we did about television and its impact. <laughs> and who watches television anymore? I want to do a whole unit called You're the Product. Like I, I miss teaching middle school sometimes, although I've been doing a lot of really cool work in media literacy. But I think you're right. I think there are places where this is easily infused, where it's logically um, prioritized and we don't have to look at it like an add-on. It's already embedded in the beautiful, challenging work that we have to do anyway. So I appreciate that. Louise, looking back on your school experience, you made a comment before about how, you know, other students that you knew really had no idea about it. Did you, through your courses, learn this um, implicitly um, or explicitly, just out of curiosity? Yeah, so I think a lot of the reason why I, I knew a bit more coming in was almost entirely Tim King like making me learn um for the uh with all the for all the best reasons um doing all the cyber titan stuff and learning a bit of that going in it wasn't like i didn't go super deep with it at that time but it gave me that like deeper than surface level knowledge that i needed to be able to go in and for uh computing to not be scary anymore for understanding that when you're typing code, it's not just this magic that happens. It's actually all these ones and zeros just happening, these tiny electrical circuits. And it was just the, it gave me kind of the push I needed for it to not seem so mystical anymore. So of course the, the courses I'm, learn, I'm uh, doing now are teaching me this a lot, a lot uh, more deeply about these topics. So about this more system level stuff. But like in Cyber Titan, it was a lot of making things not so scary anymore. So we went really deep into the computers themselves. So we always would go into the files and basically try to break computers. And you would go so far into registries that you didn't even know existed. So there's so many different parts of this computer of your software that you don't even know exist. And we would just go in and try to break stuff and see what would happen. It was very fun. It was a really good learning experience there. Wow. And it, I mean, Tim saying it's DIY student directed, but the truth is when you invite students to explore and really get messy, amazing things happen. And clearly your investment and your knowledge happen through there. Tim, you wanted to add to that? Well, and I mean, nowhere was that the case more than with Cyber Titan. When I first got into it in 2017, the students all said, we don't know anything about cybersecurity. And I said, I don't either. So we, we just learned together. And as we discovered things and, and doing that was really genuine because I would discover some things and, and then the, the team would discover some things. And by the end of it, we just recorded everything. And then the next year when Louise came along with, with, uh, with her team, suddenly there we are we had some resources for you and then we built on that and then the year after that we built on those resources again but they were all student built from the ground up 
Um, when we needed a computer, we built it ourselves. Our lab was DIY. We built it ourselves. And I, I had to fight to get that to happen. But the value in it is obvious. And Cyber Titan, you're, you're neck deep in DIY, DIY cybersecurity. And it's not... It's not even cybersecurity per se. It's defensive IT. Uh, there's nothing hacking going on in, in CyberTitan. What you're doing is you're given a compromised image and you're securing it. You're, you're fixing all of the things that the malware damaged and reestablishing firewalls. And it, all of this sounds really arcane, but it isn't. It's, it's just mechanical fixes. And as we got better and better at it, um, students started thinking, you know what, we could automate this. So they started running scripts and writing their own code to, to secure the computers. And, and from there, we got even better. It, it's a thrill to watch when it's really happening on the ground like that for sure louise did you want to add something yeah it was a uh, part of the diy aspect and the images that uh king talked about those compromised images so whenever i'm like kind of walking a friend through how to fix something on their computer they're always scared that they're going to break something like they'll click on something and magically their whole computer will <laughs> implode it. that's it but with Cyber Titan, they give you a really great environment where they give you essentially these pretend computers inside computers that you can do whatever you want with and it's not going to harm your own computer. And that kind of environment where you can really afford to make mistakes, you can just break everything and see what happens. It makes you a lot more confident in your own computer. So you know, okay, if I change the setting, the world isn't going to end. It's okay. I can just change it back. So giving kids more spaces where they can play around like that and have their actions not have as many consequences so they can actually get their hands dirty uh, digitally, I suppose, and see what they can do. It makes them a lot less scared of their own, own machines. But that whole control Z of life is something you have to show people and it's something you have to educate people about. Claudio and then Paul. I think that's uh, that's amazing. I think the same experiential approach to learning about cybersecurity works just as well for adults as it works for children. And when um, I, I used to teach at, at a couple of colleges and with my classes, I would empower those students to go um, on the dark web and these are grown-ups, right? These are grown-ups. I would give them projects and they had to not just look on the dark web and see how much our uh, personal identities are worth, but also engage in an anonymous, anonymous or pseudonymous manner with people on the dark web. And, and they found that they learned how to protect their personal information so much more by seeing the value of it. The flip side of that is how the uh, the good folks at the Knowledge Flow Foundation teach kids. And I'm one of those people, of course, but the way that this team goes into schools and says, you know what, I'm not concerned about what your name is. What is your nickname? What's your handle? What's your superhero name? And suddenly they learn about pseudonymity and they can operate from behind that, that curtain of pseudonymity for the entire period. And they ask the smartest questions and they solve problems right in front of us and they use the tools that we put, uh, that we make available to them. So um, just to, to finish up, because I see we're uh, getting close to the top of the hour, um, the idea is not so much about what we call tabloid cybersecurity, which is about sensationalizing and fear-mongering and leveraging more or less legitimacy. Uh, as far as we're concerned, we don't go in there and we say, well, look how how... I look look at me i break into banks and i get paid for it that's that's not how i talk to to kids i get <laughs> them to to touch things and play with things and if possible just like louise and tim said break things and that is exceptional because if they can break them they can put them back together yeah these playgrounds are great ways to learn thank you paul will take you and then i'm gonna just make a few announcements and say goodbye paul 
love hearing how Louise talks about um, ripping apart technology. I, when I have the opportunity through a friend I know who has recycled iPhones, I give these iPhones to some grade six, seven, eight students and I ask them to rip it apart. I say, I'm gonna get a kit from Amazon, you're gonna take it apart, you're gonna build it back together, and you're gonna make it work. And the look on their faces is amazing. I wish I had, you mm -hmm. know, I used iPhone, Android for every school I visit, I don't. They are so interested given the opportunity, and I think, and just hearing how Louise talked about it, I, it, it's what I see. I think it's truly amazing. I think we need to get more kids taken apart. I got into what I was doing because I ripped apart computers when I was a kid. I wanted to understand how it worked, then I got into coding. So if kids are, are curious, we need to give them the opportunity to explore. And so I just wanted to, to add on that. But I'm going to answer your question because I know you've asked a few in terms of internet safety, privacy, security. So I want to answer those. Internet safety. When I speak to four, five, sixes, I think one of the key messages for internet safety starts off with respecting rules. Now, a lot of our kids are on platforms they are not allowed to be on. When you're talking to a grade four, five, six group and they're bragging about being on social media, we've got a problem. Not one of them is 13 years of age. And I'm going to go mm -hmm. down a path here of what we have with internet safety, privacy, security, and relationships. When they start breaking these rules and getting on platforms, they're not allowed to be on at a young age. Number one, they're relinquishing a ton of privacy. Number two, they put themselves at risk, cyberbullying threats, inappropriate content. So the key message is we need to respect the rules. So I have three pillars for online safety, which I communicate, which is number one, respect the rules of technology. If it states you need to be 13, you wait you're 13, 17, 17, whatever. Number two, do we need smartphones in grade four, five, six? I've argued forever. The answer is no. Uh, it's a communication tool. I get it. But most kids get it out of peer pressure. Um, if there's medically related issues, I completely support it. But otherwise, you're putting too much too soon in their hand. Most adults don't even know how to use a smartphone, yet we gave it to a child, and then we allow them to have a platform they're not allowed to be on. And then we give it to them in their bedroom at home while parents are sleeping. We need to put <laughs> some basic concrete rules in place for our children. Because if you wait until they're the right age and they're more mature, and they've gone through a bit of education with passwords, and you'd be shocked as to how many kids still don't have a password on a $1,000 phone. And some of them have a four-digit password, which is absurd. We need to teach them the basics. So as they get older, they're more mature, they're more understanding, they make better choices because of education. So internet safety starts with respecting rules. Once they get to a certain age and they understand how to use the technology, we instill privacy and security, which is strong passwords, never using the same password for multiple logins. And I get challenged by high schoolers sometimes, hey, sir, how come you haven't talked about 2FA? And I say, I think two-factor authentication is critical, but some of you have simple, basic four digits. So I'm trying to get you <laughs> to just right. get into the habit of having a good first password before we get into the whole 2FA conversation. So when they get that, then we go into the communication aspect, which is, look, are you talking to your real human friends or people you think you know, kind of know, might know, which leads into point D, which is cyberbullying and digital drama, because friends who are human respect each other. They don't disrespect you. They don't threaten you. They don't harass you. They don't bully you. So when you have your real human friends, which I completely support when you are online, you have healthy relationships, not toxic relationships. So you can, the four categories that we just talked about all flow into each other with waiting for the right age, understanding the importance of privacy and security, having real human friends. Because remember, it's not about how many friends, it's about the quality of friends and the respect that those individuals show you when you're online, which then leads down to less cyberbullying and less digital drama. And so you can put all those together in a bubble and say, here's the flow of how we make it work. That starts off with some serious conversation between our educators and our, but this starts at home. Parents, it starts with you. Remember that your principals, your teachers, and the external educators that come into your schools, we are the village. We'll always be there to support you. But all this starts at home with Parenting 101.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I I feel so excited to do a better job for my students, for my daughters. And I'm really, really glad we did this show. Just a couple of announcements. April 1st comes and so does our monthly um, mentory newsletter, the Mentory Monthly. So stay up to date with the episodes here on On Ed Mentors, our upcoming circle and casual conversations, and so much more. If you're in a faculty of education in Ontario, we're building a team for our monthly Mentory Lounge episodes. We have one coming up next week where we have a group of pre service teachers here to ask a panel of mentors uh, questions around getting a job. If you want to be part of that team, uh, please fill out the form I'm going to tweet out now. I think I only have one spot left on the panel, so I'm not going to tweet that form out, but I'm excited to invite you all back for our monthly episode of the Mentory Lounge next Monday. I want to thank Stephen for extending the time so I didn't have to cut off Paul's very insightful close. And I want to thank all of you for the information, for the passion, for the interest, and for really catalyzing something that I hope the whole audience will be able to do now. Take action. Tomorrow is Cyber Day. Learn more about it. Follow all of the links I tweeted out tonight. Have a fantastic evening, everybody. Mm-hmm.